Well, hello and welcome to the Journey Church. I'm so glad to be joining you today. Let me start first by saying hello and welcome to all of you joining us in New York City. And let me say hello and welcome to all of you joining us in Boca Raton. What a fun day to have the entire Journey family together. And I am honored to get to share with you. My name is Adam Bishop, and I'll share a little bit uh, with you about my family in a second. But first, I wanna tell you why I love the Journey Church so much. See, my wife Morgan and I, Uh, spent 2007 to 2011 in New York City. We lived in Long Island City, Queens, and I served on staff at the Journey Church, and we loved our time at the Journey. In fact, your pastors, Pastor Nelson, Pastor Carrick, Pastor Jason, they still to this day have a great influence on my life. I am incredibly grateful for these godly men. In fact, I can tell you without a doubt that I'm a better Christ follower, I'm a better husband, I'm a better dad, and I'm certainly a better pastor because of their friendships. And I'm so honored that they would ask me to share with you today. I'll tell you a little bit about my family. My wife, Morgan, and I, we've been married for 21 years. We have three boys. They're all about to have birthdays, but I'll tell you their ages now. Sam is 14, Jacob is 12, and Henry is Eight. We're currently living in the Raleigh-Durham Chapel Hill area of North Carolina. I don't know if you've ever visited that part of North Carolina, but it's a great part of the state. And if you're ever in town, we'd love to have you join us here at New Hope Church on a Sunday. New Hope Church is where I started serving as the senior pastor a little over a year ago. And so we've made this our home now for about a year. Previously, I had been serving as a senior pastor at a church in Montgomery, Alabama. And we love what God is doing here at New Hope And uh, we're grateful, like I said, to be able to join you today at the Journey Church. And I'm excited that we're talking about one of my favorite characters from Scripture, David. In this series called Conquering the Giants, we're talking about different lessons from his life and how we can actually apply those lessons to our life today. And the title of our message today is Three Foundational Lessons. And what I want to do today is I want to show you from God's Word three foundational lessons that I believe God wanted to teach David before David ever ascended to his place as king. Now we're gonna see in the text we look in today how actually David was told he was going to be king one day. But these lessons that we're going to study are lessons he learned before he actually ever ascended into that position. It's almost as if God wanted to make sure that there were some foundational things grounded in David's life first before he had the opportunity to serve as king. And you know what's great about these lessons? They're foundational for us as well. See, it doesn't matter where you are at on your faith journey. I believe that these three lessons, as we put them into practice, as we put them into practice in a community of faith like the journey, as we put them into practice empowered by the Holy Spirit, I believe that they can serve us well in multiple areas of our life. So if you're taking notes today, here's how this will work. I'll give you the foundational lesson, and then I'm gonna take you to God's word and kind of read a little bit of some background uh, passage to to give a little bit of context to where this lesson comes from. But then I'm gonna be setting up a key verse for each one of these lessons that I'm gonna invite you in to read along with me. So I need you paying attention, all right? I need you to be tracking with me because when I call on you to read these verses out loud, I need you to deliver. And we might even have a little bit of a contest to see who can read these verses the loudest, those of you in New York City or those of you in Boca Raton. Now, I don't know who's gonna judge this contest, but somebody will, and they'll let me know later who won. That'll be fun, all right? So let's go ahead and jump right in. And let me share with you the first foundational lesson that we see from David's life. Here's what God wanted David to see. See, David, stay focused on your heart rather than your appearance. Stay focused on your heart rather than your appearance. And when we meet David, when we're first introduced to him in the book of 1 Samuel, up until this point in David's life, David has gotten this foundational lesson, this principle Correct. Now, we know this from the text that we're about to study, but it's important that this lesson carries David through into future chapters in his life. So let me take you to the passage of Scripture where we first meet David. And I'm going to unpack it for a second as we read from 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting in verse 6. The text says, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. We got to fill in a few gaps. First of all, it says when they arrived. 
Who's they and where are they arriving? They is actually a group of seven brothers and they're actually arriving in the home they already live. Apparently they've been outside and their father, Jesse, invites these seven brothers back into the home. Now, this is a really important day because Samuel is a prophet and prophets spoke on God's behalf in the Old Testament. Samuel has told Jesse, hey, one of your sons is going to be selected to be the next king. Now, here's why this is a rather precarious situation. There's already a king. His name is Saul. He's the first king of Israel. Samuel has already anointed Saul to be king. But you see, Saul made some really foolish decisions in his life. Saul decided he wanted to disobey God, blatantly disobey God. Saul thought he knew how to do things better than God's ways. And unfortunately, Samuel had to tell Saul, Saul, God has removed his anointing from you as the king. Now, the word anointing is a word used in the Old Testament to describe blessing. So think of it this way. Samuel told Saul, Saul, you will no longer carry the blessing as the king that God has chosen, but he still had the title as king. Now Samuel has moved on to select the next king and bestow upon him the anointing or the blessing. And this next king is going to be one of Jesse's seven sons. And as I just read, Samuel looked at Eliab, the first one, and said, surely the anointed stands here before the Lord. Verse seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. See, Eliab Eliab looked like the right choice. Apparently, he looked like what you would expect a king to look like. And even someone as godly as Samuel, a prophet of God who speaks on God's behalf, was fooled that day. He got caught up a little bit too much in appearances and forgot that what really matters is what's going on on the inside. And that's what our next verse tells us. And we're gonna read this verse out loud together. So are you ready, New York City? Are you ready, Boca Raton, Florida? Let's read this verse together. Ready, set, go. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this is so important for us to see. And on that particular day, Samuel had to be reminded of this lesson. Well, the story continues. After Eliab, six more brothers passed before Samuel. And not once does God prompt Samuel's heart, hey, this is the next king. And Samuel's confused at this point because as far as he can tell, Jesse has brought all seven sons in front of Samuel. And then he asks a rather interesting question. He looks at Jesse and he says, are these all the sons that you have? It's almost like he has a hunch that that perhaps the story isn't finished yet. And Jesse literally says, oh yeah, there's my last son, the youngest son, the runt of the litter, if you will, the, the eighth of eight sons. His name is David. He's still out in the fields taking care of the sheep. We didn't even bother to invite him to the party. And you know what Samuel says? He says, hold up. We're not doing anything else until you bring him here. And so sure enough, Jesse invites David in and, 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 and Samuel looks at David and God prompts Samuel's heart to say, this is my next king. Now, why would God choose David? Because David had some things happening on the inside in his heart that God saw that mattered to God. See, David had been making some choices for all of his life and he never even knew if anyone had noticed He didn't know if it mattered that he had been walking with God. But see, it's a really helpful thing for us to be reminded of. God's always watching. He always sees what we're doing. And can I tell you what God is looking for? God is looking for hearts that are committed to him. He's not after your perfection. Thankfully, Jesus took perfection to the cross for us, but he does care about our hearts. And up until this point in David's life, David had been been getting this Right, and, and, and God wanted to make sure that moving forward, David continued to see this. L- let me share a verse with you. It's kind of outside of our story, but I think it reinforces this point. And, and quite frankly, it's my favorite verse. I made this verse my life verse when I was about 16 years old because it really grabbed my attention. I have this verse framed hanging up in my office that I look at every day. It's a way to bring my heart back into check. And I think that God saw what this verse is describing in David, 2 Chronicles 16, nine. The eyes of the Lord searched the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts 
are fully committed to him. So God looks across the entire earth. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for hearts that are fully committed to him. And on that particular day, he found one, the heart that belonged to David. Samuel anointed him as the next king. And it's an important foundational lesson for all of us to make sure we stay focused on what's happening on the inside rather than giving into the pressures all around us to live our lives by only what we do on the external appearances. Let me give you the second foundational principle that we see from David's life. Recognize how obedience leads to opportunities. I think God wanted David to see this early on in life. Recognize how obedience leads to opportunities. And this is a really important lesson for all of us who call ourselves Christ followers as well. And what I wanna do is I wanna take you to a text and and it may not seem very significant at first, but I'm gonna read through it. We're gonna have a little bit of fun with it. And then eventually I'll get you to a verse that we're all gonna read out loud together. So let me take you to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and read a couple of verses starting in verse 17. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. Apparently this guy really liked cheese. So he's getting 10 of them, right? 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurances from them. They are with Saul and all of the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Do you see what just happened here? Jesse comes to his son, David, and he says, listen, I got a job for you to do. I need you to take some bread. I need you to take some cheese. I need you to take them to the commander, take them to your brothers. And then I need you to report back to me how they're doing. It doesn't feel like Jesse's learned any lessons. You remember, this is the same father who didn't even invite David to the party where David found out he was gonna be the next king. And he's still being rather dismissive towards David. He's giving him instructions that center around his brothers. He never even once asked David, how do you feel about this? He says, go to them and bring me back a report of how they're doing. Now, let's just stop here for a second, okay? What do we know up until this point? David has been told he's the next king. Do you know what happens when you become king? It's pretty awesome, all right? None of us will ever get to experience it. But when you become king, everybody has to do what you say. That's the benefit of being the king. David's been told he's the king. So here's how this conversation could have gone. He could have looked at his dad and said, hold up. Father, do you remember what happened recently? I was anointed the next king. You don't get to talk to me that way. You don't get to give me instructions. You no longer get to tell me what to do. In fact, I'm the one who now gets to tell you what to do. And let me tell you the last thing that's about to happen. I'm nobody's delivery boy. And I'm sure as heck not loading up a bunch of cheese just to take it to a commander. This is exactly what David could have said. Why? He's been told he's the king. But it's a pretty remarkable verse when we read it in the context of obedience. So it's the next verse, 1 Samuel 17, 20. We're gonna read this out loud together. Are you ready? In both locations, let's read it. Ready, set, go. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He did exactly what his father told him. He said, what's so remarkable about that? I mean, I hear you. Sure, he could have said those things to his father, but he got up the next day and he delivered bread and he delivered cheese. Can I tell you what happened on that particular day? David showed up to simply do what his father had instructed him to do, deliver the bread, deliver the cheese. And when he got there that day, he overheard a giant named Goliath talking trash about Yahweh God. And David decided to do something about it. That's how we have the story of David and Goliath. But can I tell you what happened that morning? I promise you when David woke up that morning, he did not look in the mirror and say, I better get ready. I better put on my best robe. I mean, today is the day. They're gonna do a series at the Journey Church one day called Conquering the Giants because of what I'm about to do today. I'm gonna walk out there and I'm gonna kill Goliath. He didn't start warming up with a sling to make sure he was loose. He did none of those things. When he woke up that morning, all he thought he was doing was obeying a command that his father had given him. And yet that simple act of obedience led David to an incredible opportunity that we still talk about centuries later. 
And so many times in our lives, we want God to open up great doors of opportunity. And you know what? I believe God wants to do that for you. But can I tell you the path that he will take you down to lead you through that door of opportunity? That path is called obedience. And there are no shortcuts in God's economy to God-sized opportunities. They always come from the path of obedience. Let me give you a story from our life recently where I was reminded of this principle. I mentioned a little earlier that we moved here a little over a year ago and two of my boys are in middle school. That's a tough time to move and have to start a new school. And so last August, when we went to the open house at their new school, my, my oldest son, who was about to start the eighth grade at the time, his name is Sam. He's a really good trumpet player and he had been heavily involved playing the trumpet back in our last home in Alabama. He had been an all-state trumpet player. He'd also played in the jazz band and, and he was really excited about jumping in and continuing to, to play now at a new middle school. And he went and I overheard this conversation I was kind of standing, you know, back because, you know, middle school boys, as the dad, you kind of have to hang back a little bit. I've learned the rules. And so I'm kind of hanging back and Sam's talking to the band instructor. And I overhear the band instructor say, we'd love to have you in our performance band. But unfortunately, the auditions for jazz band have already happened and they happened last spring and we don't have any spaces left. And so you won't be able to play in the jazz band this year. And Sam responded really well at the, at the time. He was super respectful, but I knew deep down inside that 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 was difficult news to hear. In fact, if I can just be blunt, he was devastated. So when we got home, we talked about this and he was really sad because he wasn't gonna be able to play in the jazz band this school year. But I said, you know what, buddy? Why don't we just take a season and take this before the Lord and pray about it? And let's just ask God to give you some favor with this band instructor. And, and I wanna challenge you to make this a priority. I, I, I think I heard you tell me that you can go in early for extra practice. Is that true? He said, yes. I said, well, your mom and I will take you every morning early and you get there and you show her that you're dedicated and you're committed. And when you come home from school, you practice because I do believe that God can give you this opportunity, but, but you've got to do your part as well. I mean, you've got to demonstrate some effort here and to his credit, he took that challenge and he started going to school early and he started playing and he started practicing more. And he started getting better. And about eight to 10 weeks into the school year, he came home one day and he said, dad, you're not gonna believe this. I said, what? He said, she asked me if I wanna come in Friday morning and audition for the jazz band, the band instructor. And I was like, well, buddy, have you been practicing? He said, yeah. I said, all right, let's go. So he goes in on Friday and sure enough, he makes the jazz band. And so what he'd been told only about eight to 10 weeks earlier was an impossibility in his life. Now God has given him this opportunity. Fast forward a few months later, he comes home and says, dad, there's an opportunity to audition for all district jazz band, but it's pretty competitive here in North Carolina. It's a lot more competitive than it was in Alabama. I don't really know if I can make it, but I'm thinking about auditioning. And I said, well, buddy, let's pray about it. And again, work hard and see if God opens up this opportunity. And he did. And sure enough, he made it. He was able to participate in the all district jazz band. And then a few months later passed and he comes home one day and he says, dad, I just found out that if you made the all district jazz band, you qualify for all state jazz band, but there's no way I could ever make it. I mean, all state jazz band, they only choose like five trumpet players in the entire state. And I'm like, Sam, have you not seen God move on your behalf enough so far? We're not stopping now. You need to try out for this. And so again, he worked harder. We prayed, God opened up this opportunity and Sam ended up making it. He ended up making the all-state jazz band. In fact, he was the first student in the history of his middle school to ever make all-state jazz. And can I tell you how great it's been as a dad to watch my son walk with God through this season over the last school year? But here's the principle that Sam has learned. And it's a principle that I think all of us need to be reminded of. Great opportunities always follow simple obedience. And so what area of your life do you feel God continuing to circle back around to and ask you to focus on your obedience? Obedience matters to God. And I do believe he has great opportunities in front of you. But like I said earlier, they will come back to our willingness to walk in obedience. Let me give you the third and final uh, lesson, foundational lesson from David's life that I think we see from God's word. And it's pretty simple. Keep trusting God's timing. Keep trusting God's timing. Now, that is simple to say. It is difficult to do. In fact, if I can be a little vulnerable with you today, this lesson is the one I like the least, all right? I like everything to happen yesterday. I am very proactive. I, I like to make things 
go. And, and you know what? I'm not necessarily sure that's bad as long as I'm in sync with God's timing, as long as I don't take things in to my own hands. But this lesson for David was really challenging. So let's kind of dig into the details and see why. We already know that, that David was anointed to be the next king. But something really interesting happened. See, there were about 15 years that passed from the time David found out he would be the next king until the time he actually reigned as king. See, Saul was still the king. So think about this for a second. That's a tough situation to be in. You've found out that you're actually the king. You've received the anointing of the king, but you don't yet have the title of the king. And Saul would continue to reign as king, absent from God's blessing for about 15 more years. Now you can imagine what happened during these 15 years. Saul began to hate David. His jealousy grew towards David. In fact, to the extent that Saul made it his sole focus to kill David. He had thousands of troops hunting David. David spent a significant amount of his time fleeing for his life, hiding in the wilderness. He had about three or 400 men with him to serve as his friends and to serve as his protectors. But up against the king's army of thousands, they really were at a disadvantage. And there's a particular story that occurs in 1 Samuel. I'm gonna summarize it for you because it's very interesting and it gives us insight into trusting God's timing. The way the account reads is that one day, David and his men had taken refuge in a cave. In that part of the world, there are caves everywhere and perhaps maybe to escape the heat, they had gone into a cave and we know this had to be a rather large cave because David had three to 400 men who were with him. And on that particular day, Saul and his army, as they were passing through the wilderness in pursuit of David, the text says that Saul entered into the same cave to relieve himself. That's literally in the Bible. In fact, I looked it up in the Hebrew just to see what does it mean in the Hebrew when it says the original text, Saul had to relieve himself. And you know what I found? It means that Saul had to relieve himself. It means the exact same thing that we think of now. You're like, I can't believe that's in the Bible. It is, all right? So Saul goes into the cave. Have I said it enough already? Let's say it one more time. To relieve himself, right? And David and his men are in the back of the cave. Now, David's men are like, this is the sovereign hand of God. I mean, are you serious, David? Surely God is delivering Saul into your hands. I mean, what are the odds that he would walk into the very cave that we are hiding? And in the moment, David says, well, okay, I guess these guys are right. I mean, this does kind of seem like God's orchestrated these circumstances. And so David sneaks up behind Saul while Saul's, taking care of his business. And, and he's, we're led to believe in the text that, that David's gonna kill Saul. But at the last minute, he changes his mind and all he does is cut off part of Saul's robe. And he is so convicted just from cutting off part of Saul's robe that he actually confesses this to Saul. After Saul leaves the cave, David says, I could have done this, but I didn't. I am not going to lay a hand on God's anointed. He rebukes his men for ever making this suggestion in the first place. And isn't it interesting that David says, I'm not gonna lay a hand on God's anointed when we already know that David is God's anointed. But do you know what David recognized that day? Saul's still the king. Do you know what David recognized that day? That it's never part of God's timing if you have to violate one of God's principles. And do you know what one of God's principles happens to be? Don't murder anyone. See, there's no set of circumstances where murdering the king is the right decision. And David had the wisdom to recognize that day, God has a plan and I need to trust his timing. That must have been a very difficult thing for David to do. And yet he did it. Do you know what else I think David recognized that day? I think he recognized the wisdom of playing it out when it comes to our decisions. You say, what do you mean? Well, any time in life you're facing a big decision, maybe even a temptation, it's wise to play it out. In other words, if I make this decision and I play out the consequences or I play out the subsequent steps that will occur from this decision, where will it take me? Will this be good? Will this be bad? Will this be in alignment with God's will or will this take me out 
of God's will. So let's just play this out for a second. I think David had some wisdom that day to do this. Just imagine years later, if David had followed through, if David had murdered Saul, and now he's king. Just imagine every year at the annual celebration commemorating the day where David became king, that somebody walks up and there's thousands of people gathered to celebrate, and they're about to introduce King David, and they say something like, we all remember that fateful day when David became the king, where he displayed this great act of bravery, where he snuck up behind Saul in the cave as Saul was relieving himself. And our brave, mighty warrior king stabbed him in the back in that very vulnerable moment. That's not the story you want told at your annual celebration, is it? Of course not. And I think David recognized, not only am I not supposed to violate one of God's principles, there's just also a lack of wisdom in this being the story that I tell for the rest of my life for how, for how I actually became king. But you see, God was faithful and God did have a plan and God's perfect timing did play itself out. And God took care of the situation and the circumstances that in, inevitably led to Saul's death, which then ushered in David to be the king. We're told that later in the books that Samuel shares with us in God's word. And I wanna read this verse with, with you out loud together. Are you ready in both locations? All right, ready, set, go. David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for 40 years. 30 years old, reigns for 40 years. And he cooperated with God's timing. See, sometimes God's timing is specific to some things happening in our life. Sometimes God's timing is tied to a greater story that he's telling, and we may not even know the details. You see, David is what we see as a forerunner to the real king. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus sometimes is referred to as the son of David. That In many ways, David's life points us to the true king. David had some flaws. David had some mistakes. David was not perfect. He was pointing us to Jesus. And it was significant that David became king at the age of 30. Why? Because it was at the age of 30 that Jesus began to serve in his public ministry. See, anytime we study God's word, if we look hard enough, it will point us to Jesus, our one true king. And so God was up to something even greater than what David could recognize in real time. And if you're walking through a season right now and it doesn't make sense, maybe in your career, maybe in your marriage, maybe in parenting, maybe in finances, maybe in your health. You're asking God to do something. You know that you're asking within his will and it's just not happening on the timeline that you would prefer. Can I encourage you today? Keep trusting God's timeline. See, God knows some things you don't know. God is doing some things that you're not aware of. And if you had all of the available information, you would be at peace with how God is directing your life. And so can I encourage you and challenge you to go ahead and step into that peace today. And when you step into that peace today, here's what you're communicating to God. God, I trust you. So we've looked at these three foundational lessons. And here's what I know about any time we study God's word. There's a good chance that one of those is exactly where you're at today. That one of those lessons, God really used it to speak to you. And so let's just kind of review these in closing today. We've looked at three of them. And I wanna challenge you, which one of these three are you gonna to commit to putting in to practice? Maybe you need to stay focused on your heart. It's really easy in the world we live in today to be caught up in ex external appearances. Maybe you need to take a break from some social media. Maybe that's not having the best effect on you right now. And God's kind of refocused your heart on staying focused on your heart today. Perhaps you need to recognize how obedience leads to opportunities. You're asking God for the opportunity. Nothing wrong with that but you're missing the all important step of obedience. Maybe that's the next step you wanna commit yourself to today. And then finally, perhaps you're really struggling with God's timing. I've been there. I know how hard that can be. And maybe once again today, you're just recommitting your heart to God and saying, God, I trust you. I'm not going to violate your principles and pursuit of trying to make things happen. I will trust you that in your perfect timing, I will see you accomplish your perfect will. Hey, can I pray for you today? that by God's strength and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're able to put these next steps into practice. So would you join me as we pray? And so God, we come to you right now and quite simply, we just say thank you. We say thank you that you've included men like David in your word. God, we're thankful that we can learn from his mistakes, but God, we're also thankful that we can learn from some of the lessons that you taught him. 
lessons that we've studied today, lessons that are important for us to recognize, like you look at our heart, that obedience matters, that you do have great opportunities for us and that we need to trust your timing. And God, I know that with this many people hearing this message today, there are so many different circumstances and situations that people are walking through. And God, I'm grateful that as our heavenly father, you know the details of each one of those situations. And so I'm just asking for you to move on behalf of your people. God, I'm asking for you to speak and to guide. God, I'm asking for you to pour out your spirit so that we don't try to put these lessons into practice and in our own strength, but we do so through the power of the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for a church like The Journey where people can come together, be encouraged by one another and grow in their faith. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.